let's summarize a kind of a standard view of animal mitotic spindle function. Because I know, let's face it, you don't all watch to the end of these videos, do you? Okay, upon nuclear envelope breakdown, the microtubules that are randomly emitted by the spindle poles uh, become able to interact with chromatin you know, that's condensed following DNA replication. Uh, random encounters between microtubules and kinetochores form connections to the poles, which become these robust K-fibers and metaphase. Then there's a stochastic tug of war between the poles for each chromosome that equilibrates the distances between the poles while somehow resolving aberrant connections. There's a lot of turnover within the spindle that is presumed to function to mediate that resolution so that the most stable, correct connections survive. When all of the kinetic cores are under tension at the midplane, balanced between both poles, they all go quiet and the cell cycle proceeds into anaphase, scissoring apart the two replicated sisters in each chromosome so that the sister chromatids are drawn by poleward flux of the kinetic uh, of kinetochore attached microtubules towards the poles. Now, watching spindle assembly in living cells, especially relatively small ones that are not in great hurry to divide, certainly gives one the impression that the spindle poles randomly emit microtubules, the subset that happens to be directed correctly towards uh, kinetochore, uh, are the ones that survive and, and become the, the basis for most of the spindle. Uh, however, if we revisit the kind of argument we made about pronuclear migration, the kind of arithmetical argument about how many microtubules it would take to search space, then it quickly becomes apparent that this picture is a little too simplistic. So let's imagine, again, the perspective of the spindle pole over here, represented by the centriole pair at this point, at the heart of the centrosome. Microtubules are nucleated in its vicinity and grow out from here. With their plus ends aiming in the general direction of the chromatin. Now to scale, if I draw a chromosome over here with its Kinetochores, it might be something like 10 microns away, five or 10, depends on the cell type, depends on you know, where it happened to be in the nucleus when it broke down. And the point is those kinetochores in there, they're tiny little targets. So this distance here is something like 10 microns. And this object is about 100 nanometers in diameter. Then if you imagine the centrosome sort of shooting an arrow toward this tiny little hole in that it has to hit, this tiny little target over there, it corresponds to about half a degree of arc it has to get aim a microtubule within in order to, in order to hit that object half a degree of arc is about the size of the full moon in the night sky roughly so imagine just randomly throwing something up and hoping to hit the moon how many how many times would you have to toss a rock uh, to hit that little spot so uh, a microtubule um, that 100 nanometer circle, let me just first say, if we consider uh, 
a search surface that's 10 microns in diameter. The surface area that needs to be searched is uh, this is 160,000. Excuse me, of the search sphere. Okay, so one in every 160,000 microtubules is going to hit the kinetochore if it lives that long. Okay, so how long does it take? A microtubule takes about um, five to 10 microns a minute if it doesn't undergo catastrophe first, right? So it needs at least a minute to grow over there if it survived. How many microtubules can the centrosome make at once? Well, okay, if it can make 160,000 at once, it can guarantee hitting the target, right? By just randomly directing them everywhere. Um, pretty simple, it probably can't, but as you'll see for other reasons, it doesn't really matter. Let's say a realistic number is more like, maybe the centrosome can sustain Ten to the third looking at an embryonic cell, you might say, "Oh come on, it, it could be more than that, uh, maybe ten to the fourth it won't really matter that much. Looking at a small cell, you might say, "I don't think that's a thousand microtubules around that little thing. Um, maybe it's more like a hundred well, at any rate, let's just take a thousand for starters to make a thousand microtubules that are 10 microns long if it's uh, at 1600 tubulin proteins per micron of microtubule that means you need greater than 10 million tubulins to concentrate into this sphere, this 10 micron sphere around the spindle pole. Is that even possible? Well, let's see. Uh, it is a lot. Uh, it turns out 10 micromolar, which is about the total, total tubulin concentration in the whole cell, 10 micromolar is six times 10 to the sixth molecules per picoliter. So that's about as high a concentration of protein as you can imagine getting into um, this vicinity, picoliter being about the, the search volume that we're talking about. Um, now that still only gets us enough microtubules to search something less than 1% of the search area per minute, let's say. So quibble with the arithmetic if you want. Uh, you probably don't. Uh, you could say well, if it's 10 to the fourth, you could make more, but it's not gonna get you much further. You'd have to have an unrealistic protein concentration in that volume of cytoplasm. Certainly 10 to the fifth wouldn't be possible. It still wouldn't get you an efficient search and capture mechanism based simply on random assembly of microtubules in all directions, no matter what it looks like. So the arithmetic suggests that mitotic spindle assembly must involve some sort of additional mechanisms that either make the targets effectively larger, right? or bias the search so that microtubules somehow know to grow that way. And all these other strays over here, well, maybe they have some other purpose. So we can ignore trivial solutions such as making the nucleus really, really small or giving the cell cycle infinite time, right? Cells could make bigger kinetochores and some cells do. Uh, examples include nematodes and butterflies and um, <clears throat> some other organisms in which the chromosomes are holocentric. That is, the entire condensed chromosome during mitosis behaves as a platform for kinetochore assembly and can capture microtubules. You could, um, instead of 
having the spindle poles push away from each other and um, at the same time as they're trying to find the chromosomes get as far apart from each other as possible, you could send them on a dive in amongst the chromatin. Um, which, as we'll see, is something that diatoms basically do to perhaps solve this, this kind of problem. Or you could increase the capture reach of kinetic ores somehow. Um, and it turns out that the centrosomes are not the only site of microtubule nucleation in a mitotic cell. So let's take a look at this metaphase spindle tubulin uh, assembly into microtubules. Microtubules are uh, sensitive to cold. You can make them fall apart very rapidly by chilling cells to close to freezing temperature in most organisms. One wonders how fish in the Antarctic do it. But at any rate, let's cool this cell down to zero degrees. Certainly this works for mammalian cells. It also happens to work for echinoderm embryos. It's pretty straightforward. And all of the microtubules will fall apart. The spindle poles will stay more or less where they are for a little while. The chromosomes, which were nicely lined up, they, uh, they won't get out of there immediately. So you can do this experiment without completely uh, wrecking the cell's chances of um, having a successful division. Okay, so so these are uh, chilling out for perhaps a few minutes, long enough for all the microtubules to disassemble, and then you return this cell to the physiological temperature. And um, you won't be surprised to hear that the spindle poles rapidly start to regrow many, many microtubules in all directions. However, now that the spindle has gone away, it becomes apparent that microtubule nucleation is happening at kinetochores too. Each of these chromosomes develops little brushes in the vicinity of its kinetochores. Just as if they are reaching out and trying, oh, that one made it, look at that, and this one's going to as well, just as if they are reaching out and trying to plug into the microtubules regrowing from there. And indeed, further experiments show that you can get bipolar spindles to assemble without any centrosomes at all around DNA-coated beads, at least in frog egg extracts and a couple other similar circumstances. Um, and some meiotic spindles, in animals, and maybe all spindles and land plants use this kinetochore organized mechanism exclusively. Okay, so that illustrates one solution, increasing the capture reach of kinetochores. How about a way to bias the search instead? In order to explain this mechanism, I'm going to take what seems like a detour to what 20 years ago was a totally different part of the cell biology textbook. And I'm going to explain the rudiments of the nuclear import and export machinery. Now, you have to understand the nucleus is walled off from the cytoplasm by a membrane, but that membrane contains pores to allow transport between the cytoplasm and the nucleus, of course. How else would anything get in and out? Those pores are filled with a gel, basically, that is transited diffusively, easily, by relatively small molecules. Anything below about 40 kilodaltons passively goes in and out of the nucleus. But large molecules have to be conducted through by uh, some sort of a navigator that can get through that, um, that gel. And one of those, key one, is 
a protein called importin. Importin recognizes cargos based on a surface loop that happens to have a lot of positive charge. These get together and we've got this snaky little hook shaped protein. It's actually a fairly big snaky hook shaped protein that knows how to wend its way through How does it know when it's in the cytoplasm, where it's supposed to pick up its cargo, and when it's gotten to the nucleus? And that's where this darling little protein comes in. This is RAN, and it's named because it was one of the first proteins discovered that was similar to the protein RAS. And RAS is the original small GTPase it was named because it's the causative agent in derived form for Rouse sarcoma a cancer it's one of the original oncogenes RAS turned out to be a signaling protein widely used by cells to transmit things that happen at the cell surface involving receptors to the rest of the cytoplasm. So people found this protein ran, and it was like RAS, but it was in the nerve cells, and they called it RAN. And it turned out, well, it was actually in every cell, and, and a lot of it is involved in nuclear important export. So then the N turned into RAN for RAS of the nucleus. Okay, it's a small GTPase, it binds GTP. This is ran in GDP bound form. And this is ran in GTP bound form. This should sound somewhat familiar by now. RAN hydrolyzes GTP, but it does so slowly. It's a crappy enzyme, and that's key to its function here. Okay? So on um, a time scale of really minutes, RAN might spontaneously hydrolyze its GTP. It's also not terribly good at exchanging its GDP for a fresh GTP. And also takes some time, typically. And these reactions, these exchange reactions, are greatly accelerated by two accessory proteins. One of these, which is called a GTPase activating protein, or GAP, greatly accelerates the rate of GTP hydrolysis by RAN. Another of these, Another one called a guanine nucleotide exchange factor, hence for GEF, because it's a lot easier to say, greatly accelerates the rate of nucleotide exchange, that is, the recharging. Now, what I've just said about RAN is true of almost all of the small GTPases, of which there's RAS. There's RAN. We'll hear more about Rho and its, uh, its family members, CDC42 and RAC. And on and on, we'll hear toward the end of the course about RABS and a variety of others. There are dozens of small GTPases that work in cells, and this general picture applies for all of them. They hydrolyze GTP, but they're not very good at it, and they need help from accessory proteins to complete this cycle. As they do so, incidentally, the gap works typically by supplying a missing amino acid to the catalytic site, to the active site of this enzyme. It sticks in an arginine finger that helps with GTP hydrolysis. Key to the function of small GTPases is not only that they have this regulated cycle of GTP hydrolysis, I mean, heck, anybody can hydrolyze GTP, right? Um, can't they? but that they change shape while they do so. 
as depicted over here on this other side. Imagine a mousetrap, not the nice kind of mousetrap, the mean kind that snaps necks, right? Okay. The key thing here is that in this cocked primed form, proteins might be able to bind to, or vice versa, proteins might be able to bind to this interface, but not that one. As it happens, for most small GTPA signaling proteins, it is the GTP bound form, which is active, which creates so much confusion when you have the GTPA's activating protein inactivating the GTPA's uh, by activating its GTPA's function. You can rewind and listen to that again if you want, <laughs> it'll come up again, um, but at any rate, for most small GTPAs, as it turns out, this GTP bound form is the active form that binds other proteins, whereas the GDP bound form doesn't. I'm starting with RAN here because it's the simplest of the lot. Okay, so how does this relate to nuclear import? Because RAN binds to important this notch here is a ran binding site but it's only a binding site for gtp ran okay and important changes configuration changes its conformation when it's bound to ran in such a way as to drop off the cargo I was carrying. It's really quite simple. All we need is a way to ensure that RAN GTP primarily exists in the nucleus, and there's hardly any RAN GTP in the cytoplasm. Then important will bind its cargos in the cytoplasm because there's no RAN GTP around to release them. But once it gets into the nucleus, it'll encounter RAN GTP, drop off its cargos, and go back for more. So we need to make sure that RAN GTP is only high in the cytoplasm. The obvious solution is to make sure that the gap is a cytoplasmic protein. That is, that it doesn't have one of these handles, this nuclear localization sequence, that will allow it to interact with important and get transported through the nuclear pores. So the gap has to be cytoplasmic. And, all... and you can probably see this one coming. The GEF is a nuclear protein more than that, it is actually bound to chromatin. So RAN can only recharge, get a fresh GTP if it's in the nucleus and can encounter this chromatin bound GEF, whereupon it will be able to interact with important coming in with cargo and induce it to drop off its cargo inside the nucleus. Okay. Okay, here we've got our nuclear membrane studded with nuclear pores. Here's important laden with a cargo, and the important can navigate its way through the nuclear pores, of course. Now, RAN is small. RAN can just go right in too, or out, 
if it wants. I mean, I'm sure it's it's slowed down a little bit. So this RAM GTP, excuse me, RAM GDP can make its way in there where it will encounter the waiting GEF. And it can be recharged to what we'll call its active form, which in turn can couple with this important thus inducing it to drop off its cargo where it belongs in the nucleus. Now, uh, this species can go right back out. And of course, once it does so, it might dissociate from uh, the, the RAN GTP because their binding isn't terribly tight and become able to hook up another with another cargo. Meanwhile, RAN GTP encounters the gap and hydrolyzes its GTP we have one thing left to draw here how do proteins get out of the nucleus well of course important and can snuggle its way through the pore that's what it's designed for um, RAN can diffuse through the nuclear pore, as can other small proteins. Small GTPases, as you might guess from their name, are small proteins. They're in the 20 kilodalton range, so they go through nuclear pores relatively easily. Um, something like tubulin does not. It's just above the cutoff. The tubulin dimer certainly doesn't go through the nuclear pore easily. The answer is another protein closely related to importin, the exportins, The exportins regulate, recognize, excuse me, recognize a nuclear export signal, which, surprise, is a surface loop with some negative charge. And exportins can only bind their cargo when they are bound to GTP RAN. So the exportins can only bind their cargo when bound to GTP RAN. They conduct cargo out of the nucleus. And of course, they also release GTP bound RAN into the cytoplasm where it is discharged by its encounter with the gap and the cycle repeats, okay? So that in a nutshell is how nuclear import and export works. What relevance could this possibly have for mitosis when the nucleus breaks down? Let's go back over to the other side of the board. And we'll get rid of uh, this little experiment here. Now, the nuclear membrane indeed falls apart but the ran gef remains bound to chromatin, and it, of course, remains active during uh, mitosis. Why not? And in the vicinity of the chromosomes, it is activating ran. It is stimulating it to exchange GDP for GTP. such that 
the chromosomes are effectively emitting RAM GTP in a little cloud around, the, around, around themselves. The gap is out there in the cytoplasm. It's everywhere. And it's stimulating RAN to hydrolyze its GTP. But if you have a localized source and a distributed sink, the expectation is that a gradient will develop near the source RAN GTP concentration is high because wherever there's a chromosome, there's a little cloud of RAN. It's a kind of a smell of chromosome, O de chromatin. But as you go further and further away, more and more opportunities for that RAN GTP to encounter a gap will have transpired and the concentration of RAN GTP will be low, far from the chromosomes. That is, out here, right? So RAN will be high near the chromosomes, low away from them. All you have to do is rig up a means by which microtubules or their catastrophe rate, something about their growth rate, uh, will be more likely to survive in the presence of RAN GTP than without. And that's exactly the way it works. This smell of chromosome, RAN GTP, binds to a set of microtubule proteins that limit catastrophe such that microtubules are more likely to survive and, gro and continue growing if they are growing toward chromatin. And that is a very powerful way to bias the search by the centrosomes for each of the kinetochores.